School has just started and you're super excited to start your new career. There's just one problem. For some reason, your students aren't listening to you. Your students are out of their seats, they're talking to each other, and there's a couple of students in your class who are having a really hard time listening and following directions. You feel lost and you're not quite sure what to do. If this is you, you're not alone. Managing a classroom is one of the hardest parts of teaching, but with the right tools and resources, you can have one of the most well-behaved classrooms in the school. That's why today I'm going to share with you the top five mistakes you might be making when your students aren't listening to you so you know what to avoid and to save you some time that many of us wish we could have saved in the beginning. And just a heads up, some of these might be a little controversial, but I'm here to give you my honest opinion. And if you hear something that doesn't align with your values, please take it with a grain of salt and use what works for you. One of the most common mistakes I see teachers make when it comes to getting their students to follow directions is that they take away their recess. Oftentimes, staff will take away a student's recess in order for them to take some time to think about the disruptive behavior they're doing or the fact that they're not listening to directions. In fact, this is so common that a survey done by International Play Equipment Manufacturers Association, or IPEMA, found that 86% of teachers have in fact taken a reduced or taken away a recess completely as a punishment for behavior. However, studies show that this isn't effective. An article published by Hetchner Report says withholding recess as a punishment can negatively affect a child's relationships with teachers, feelings about school, and even a sense of self-worth. It is a punishment that is especially stigmatizing and visible to their peers. So with all that being said, let's talk about why taking away recess doesn't work. Now, one thing you should know about me is I try really hard to be super honest and super transparent about my history and teaching, and that is I have, in fact, been one of those teachers who took away recess because I saw so many other teachers doing it, and I thought that's what you're supposed to do. But along the way, I've learned a certain amount of things on why that's a bad idea. The first thing is that students tend to fixate on the idea that they are the bad kid, and because they don't get to do fun stuff like the other kids, that labels them as a bad kid. And oftentimes, once you take away a student's recess, the rest of the day can be completely ruined because they're stuck on that mindset that they are, in fact, a bad kid. And it can be really hard after that one incident for them to have a great rest of the day. When you take away a student's recess, they're not seeing themselves as learning a lesson. They're learning that they are, in fact, a bad kid. Another thing I've learned along the way is that students need to move around and play. Oftentimes, the students who are making those disruptive behavior choices are the ones who need to move around the most. By taking away that one or two times a day that students actually get the opportunity to let out their energy, you are denying them the opportunity to release that energy in a healthy way. And let me just tell you from teacher to teacher, by doing so, you're going to find that you're going to make your life harder and that student's life harder because you are taking that time away from them that they can exert that energy. Another reason this is a huge mistake is it can actually harm your relationship with the student. When you take away a student's recess, to them, you just label them as a bad kid. They no longer trust you and they think that you see them just like everybody else and it can be re really hurtful that you label them that way. Also, students don't learn the lesson you are trying to teach them. If anything, they are more likely to repeat the same mistake or disruptive behavior that they had earlier because the consequences weren't connected. If I have a student talking in class and I take their recess away, that has no correlation between the two. Or if I have a student who isn't completing their work and I take away their recess away, that has no correlation between the two. However, if I were supposed to give them a natural consequence, whereas they need to finish their work or they get this other consequence of sending a note home that they aren't completing their work, that's a natural consequence. What you want to do is you want to find a natural consequence. So an example of this would be, let's say a student made a mess in the bathroom, so you take their recess away. Well, the two things aren't really correlated. Whereas if you have a student who is playing in the bathroom and made a mess, the natural consequence is they pick it up. That is a natural consequence. The student is learning their lesson because 
if they didn't make the mess, they wouldn't have a mess to clean, therefore a natural consequence. But if you make them sit out for recess, now they're just thinking, wow, I'm a bad kid and I always make bad choices. I don't know how to turn this around and I can't. They're not learning that, oh, I need to stop making a mess in the bathroom. Instead, they're learning, I'm a bad kid. This is what bad kids do. Another thing about taking away recess and why it's such a big mistake is because it calls them out publicly to their peers. I don't know about you, but growing up, I never wanted to be one of those kids that was missing recess. And we all knew who that kid was that was constantly missing recess. You don't want to call them out on that behavior because it is cause calling them out in front of their peers and it's breaking those relationships. And it also brings me to my next big mistake, which is to number two, stop the class to address behavior or to publicly address disruptive behavior. In general, it's okay to stop a class or instruction if the following is happening. One, someone is harmed or two, someone is going to harm someone or someone else or themselves with what they're about to do. Or three, a student is going to leave the classroom without supervision and not intentionally or without your permission, let's say. Otherwise, you are going to be walking into a power struggle with that student if you publicly call out a student for doing that. So for example, if you are teaching whole group and one of your students interrupts me, you don't want to call out that student and say, so-and-so, I am talking, you're interrupting. That is calling out that behavior in front of everybody and you're singling out that student. Instead, you want to do something else. So there's several reasons why this is such a big mistake. The number one reason is what you're walking into is typically a power struggle. Now, the definition of a power struggle, according to Google, is a situation in which two or more people or groups compete for control in a particular sphere. So essentially what you're doing is you are struggling for control in your classroom with a student, and that's never a good thing. When you walk into a power struggle with the student, what you're really doing is you're losing credibility with not only that student, but also their peers. And what often happens when you call out a student in front of their peers is you jump into a power struggle because that student feels called out. They're going to respond and you are going to now be in a battle of who got the last say. And that's not what you want to do. I never recommend calling out a student's behavior in class. But here's some things you can do instead. The first thing I like to do when a student is interacting in a disruptive behavior or taking on a disruptive behavior is I like to do a couple different things. The first thing I like to do is use proximity. So let's say we go back to the example if I have a student who is maybe talking to their friend while I'm teaching. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my proximity to get that student to stop and to refocus and re-engage with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk near that student and just by being closer to them, they're going to stop because they're going to feel my presence and they're going to remember what they should be doing. So that's the first thing I like to do is proximity. Now, sometimes that won't work and you need to move on to another level. What I like to do after that is if a student still isn't getting it, Instead of stopping instruction to call out that student, I will start calling out the positives, three positive friends that are doing the right thing. So I might call three students right next to that student who is doing the right thing. I love how so-and-so is sitting crisscross applesauce. I love how so-and-so has their eyes on me. I love how so-and-so has their voice at a level zero. All of these are a way for that student to re-engage and to remember what they're doing. And it's a model of what they should be doing right now. After that, typically the student will fix their behavior on what your expectations are. When they do this, I like to call them out. So you call out three students, and once that student fixes their behavior, you then praise them as well. The next thing I recommend to do is to pull your students aside when you're ready to address the behavior. So instead of calling your student out in front of all their friends and their peers, I recommend that you pull them out maybe into the hallway with the door propped open or cracked open so you can still keep an eye on the class while you have a one-on-one discussion with that student. So the reason you want to do this is because then you can discuss the behavior you're seeing and then you can then give them two consequences or two choices on how they want to move forward. So typically this discussion for me goes like this. The first thing I'll do is I'll point out what I notice about their behavior. So I'll say, I notice that in class you're having a hard time completing your work. 
is that true? What am I, or is that true? Or what do you notice? Or what's going on? Or something like that. And hearing their side of the story so they have a chance to defend themselves. Because you don't want to just go and accuse them and not have an open discussion. You want it to have a two-way discussion about what's going on. Then I give them in a neutral, calm, collected tone the two choices. You have two choices. Right now you can go in and complete your work or I can send a note home to your family telling them that you're refusing to complete your working class. Which choice would you like to have? Giving your students choices is a great way to give the power back to them without getting in a power struggle. That way they feel like they still have a say in what's going on, but they don't have complete control of your class, therefore minimizing the chance of a power struggle and then being consistent with whatever you talk about. So out of those three, proximity and then three positives and then sideline is a great way to avoid those common mistakes when it comes to your students not listening and following directions in class. All right, the third mistake I see a lot of teachers make are clip charts. Now, this is going to be a very controversial topic that I'm going to cover right now, but these this mistake is very similar to the first two mistakes that I talked about, but having a clip chart in your classroom is a huge mistake. And one of the reasons I feel like I can talk about this is because I did, in fact, have a clip chart in my classroom the first two years of teaching. With everything that we talked about in mind, here's why they are a bad idea. And in case you're not familiar with what a clip chart is, essentially there's different levels of colored paper and students will clip up or down depending on how they act in class. And you, they typically all start in the same color and then throughout the day they can move one or two levels up or one level down. And typically you have them move their pen out by saying, so-and-so, please move your pen down for blah, blah, blah. So-and-so, I love how you are. Insert compliment here. Please move your pen up. Now, here are the downfalls to a clip chart. Again, I will admit that I have used these because back in the day, everyone was, but here are the mistakes and the problems I quickly found with them. The first one being when you have a clip chart, students will often compare each other and how they are doing. And it's really hard to not compare your self-worth to a clip chart when it says something like, you're great, or you're awesome, or doing great. And then down below it says, bad choices, or big mistake, or main mistake, or um, do better next time, stuff like that. It's really hard for students to separate their own self-worth with words like this. And then also, students are often labeled as the bad kid for a choice that they made. Once they make one bad choice, they are therefore almost publicly punished for making that mistake, and then they clip down in front of the whole class. And it's really hard for them in their mindset to restart the day and they will often find anxious and it's hard for them to move back up. For some students, it does work, but others, it can be a complete day crusher on how their day goes. Another reason why this is a big mistake is students are publicly humiliated. This often goes with the second mistake I said, where you are publicly calling out their mistakes in front of everyone to see. And I know I personally don't like when I make a mistake in the classroom and if the principal were to tell me to clip down because I made a mistake in my teaching, instead, I would appreciate it if they pulled me to the side to have a conversation about how what I could do better next time. And according to teachergoals.com, clip charts have been shown to intensify anxious behavior and decrease engagement. And I saw this time and time again in the classroom when one of my students would clip down, some of them would completely shut down and they would have a hard, hard time coming back and bringing themselves back into the moment because they were now panicked that they were labeled or clipped down and they were caught up in how in the world are they going to bring themselves up and the fact that they were now considered a bad kid. One video that I absolutely recommend you check out by one fat teacher is she talks all about clip charts and her experience with that so I highly recommend you check it out in the description down below. So you might be wondering, what do I use instead of a clip chart? Well, along the way, I have ran into this book called Whole Brain Teaching for Challenging Kids. I love this book. Now, I don't use all of the strategies that this book recommends. Along the years, I have kind of perfected my own 
style of teaching and managing my classroom. But one thing they use is a super improver wall and I absolutely love it. It focuses more on the positive behavior and how to help your students become model students as opposed to focusing on the negative behavior of clip charts. In fact, after I used it for a couple of years in my district, I had some teacher friends ask me for the super improver wall resources I had and several teachers in my building ended up using it and they loved it. So I will put links in the description for you to check out if you want to learn more about that. Another mistake I see teachers make when it comes to getting their students to follow directions is they're not reviewing or teaching their procedures in a thorough way or they're not modeling them. Let's talk about procedures. Procedures are the habits on how you want your students to interact and behave in the classroom. There are nothing more than simple habits on how you want your students to interact and behave in the classroom. So with that being said, here are some questions to ask yourself if you feel like your procedures might be the reason why your students aren't following directions. The first one is to ask yourself, when I taught this procedure, was I clear? The second one is, did I model what it looked like and sounded like? And the third thing, did we practice? Fourth, do we need to review it? Consider all these questions when you are looking at your procedures. So if you feel like you did teach your procedures right, it's still worth a shot to go back and review the procedure with your class. The fifth mistake you might be making when it comes to getting your students to pay attention or follow directions is building a strong relationship with your students. One of the first steps to strong classroom management is building a strong relationship. So many teachers miss this step because they are so short on time. They may only have a limited amount of time that they have at the beginning of the year to teach procedures and the expectations in the classroom, let alone how to build those relationships. So take some time to get to know each of your students, get to know what interest about them outside of school. Do they play soccer? What sports are they into? What kind of music do they like? Do they play video games? What's their favorite TV show or their favorite cartoon? Another way you can do this is to do a brain break activity or a classroom building activity to help boost your community in the classroom. And also, I love to do brain breaks with my kids. Not only do I facilitate them, but once my kids have it down, I'll actually play the brain breaks with them because I feel like it's really important to build that sense of community and that relationship. And also make sure to talk to them about things outside of school. Get to know about their families. How many brothers and sisters do they have? Who do they live with? Do they have any pets? Show them that you care about them more than academics and you'll be on your way to create strong relationships. Here are the top five mistakes you might be making when your students aren't listening to you or aren't following directions to the classroom. The first one was taking away recess. The second one was calling out students when they are interacting in a disruptive way. The third thing was using clip charts. Fourth was not reviewing your procedures or teaching them thoroughly. And the fifth is not building a strong relationship with your students. Thank you so much for joining. If you found this helpful and want to learn more, I recommend checking out the three-day classroom management challenge while I, where I will be showing you how to transform your classroom in just three days. If you found this helpful, I would really appreciate if you could like and subscribe to get notified about when part two of this classroom management series comes out. As always, remember that we are stronger together and I will see you next time, teacher bestie. Bye.